Okay. Um, so we went over this uh, iterative decoding on the tenor graph uh, of a linear block code. And uh, uh, the, the point to be noticed is that uh, the decoder, the amount of calculations that uh, it will have to do uh, for each of the check nodes and also for each of the variable nodes depends on the degree of that particular node. So if a node is connected to uh, 100 different, uh, suppose this particular CN check node is connected to 100 VNs, uh, then it will have to, first of all, get messages from all those 100 VNs and then it will have to do some numerical computation that will be roughly proportional to 100 maybe 100 sums or 100 multiplies or something. Uh, same thing about what a VN has to do. That, that will also depend on roughly the degree of that particular VN. More specifically, the amount of computations that each node has to do will not depend on the length of the code. The length of the code can become uh, maybe a million bits but what each CN and what each VN has to do will depend only upon DC and DV. Now, it turns out that uh, to get a channel coding scheme which works very well, and in the parlance of coding theory, uh, it is known as achieving capacity. Why it is called achieving capacity, we will uh, describe that later on. Uh, but this part to achieve capacity, all that it means is that, is that a coding scheme which works really good, very well. It's able to correct um, a lot of errors per, for, for its rate. Uh, so basically to improve the performance of a coding scheme, it is known that we need to make the coding uh, length to be large. N has to be very large. Uh, typically what happens is that when you make n large, the decoding complexity increases. That, that is what we saw in uh, the context of uh, the syndrome decoding or the standard error decoding. Decoding complexity uh, exponentially increases. Uh, for example, the memory requirement become, is 2 to the power n. Uh, and that is where a lot of those uh, decoding schemes are simply not practical when n becomes large. But in this particular case, uh, from the graphical viewpoint, we can see that uh, as long as we do not make dc and dv to be very large, our decoding scheme is not going to get too much complex, computationally complex. Uh, and we would have made the n large uh, that way and our performance would have increased uh, without a corresponding increase in the computational com complexity. This is the idea behind uh, one of the uh, very well-known codes these days. It, is, uh, it has gained a lot of prominence. Uh, it, I think uh, uh, in the context of 5G, uh, these codes are getting uh, to be used. So when you get your 5G phone, uh, your phone will have this particular code, which is known as low density parity check code. And LDPC code by, by, the, by its name is a code whose parity check matrix has low density. And by low density, what it means is that uh, the edge matrix is pretty big. Uh, the number of rows and number of columns is very large but most of them are zeros. There are only few ones. And remember, the weight of the row vector, number of ones in the row vector, is same as DC, the degree of check node. Um, and number of ones in the column vector of H matrix is nothing but the degree of variable node. Because the, each of the column vectors of H matrix specifies this connections, the connections of upper, the VN corresponding to that column. 
each of the row of H matrix specifies this connection, the connections of a CN corresponding to that particular row of H matrix. And so therefore, uh, the number of ones in the row is same as DC for that uh, check node. Number of ones in a particular column of H matrix is same as DV for that variable node. And for low density parity check codes, uh, this DC and DV are independent of N. N can become large, but DC and DV remain some small values. And therefore, the decoder doesn't become highly complex even if you make the length of the coding scheme N to be large. That is why it is called low density parity check codes. In fact, they were first described by Robert Gallagher, who, was, uh, who did his PhD from MIT, uh, all the way back in 1960. And, and he, his PhD research was fantastic. He proposed his codes and analyzed them and showed that they are quite powerful codes. But in those days, uh, you know, we didn't have uh, MATLAB or C++ the way, they, the way we have now. And so there was not a lot of numerical backup uh, of the performance of his proposal. Uh, the type of work that you are doing, for example, in your project, uh, that was simply not feasible in those days. And so after he proposed this LDPC course, they were forgotten for a long time. And then they were again discovered in mid-90s by DJC McKay. You have heard his, uh, his name before. Actually, you have read his book. Uh, we, we are relying on his text, the textbook that he has written. Uh, so the author of that textbook, uh, David McKay, uh, actually discovered this LDPC codes in mid 90s. And uh, there, there are other important class of codes which are known as turbo codes, which are also very powerful. And actually your 4G phones today have turbo codes. Uh, so, uh, both the LDPC and Turbo codes are now considered as very powerful set of codes and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, particularly the LDPC codes were discovered in mid-90s and uh, they are, it's about now, almost 25 years later that they are finally going to get implemented in our cell phones. So this is the example of an LDPC code. It is a pretty small size code. Uh, the re actual LDPC codes are far, far bigger. For the edge metrics of uh, LDPC codes are much, much more bigger. But this gives an idea of what LDPC codes edge metrics looks like. Um, so you will see that most of this edge metrics is filled with zeros. I have not put zeros uh, in this. Wherever there is a blank, you have to assume that it's a zero. Um, second thing you will notice is that each column has four ones. Uh, so degree of each of these check nodes is four. Alternatively, the weight of each row, weight R, weight of each row is four. And degree of variable node, which is the weight of column, is always three. So this is a uh, three four code it's called regular code because the degree of the check node or the degree of variable node is a constant uh, and so that's why it's a constant uh, DC constant DV regular code three four regular code in fact three over four is also the ratio of the number of rows divided by the number of columns of this parity check matrix. If LDPC code is a regular code, that ho always holds um, DV, which is 3, divided by DC, which is 4, is always equal to the number of rows of H matrix divided by number of columns. Okay, so I think uh, let us stop here and um, uh, maybe uh, the last, the very last topic that, that uh, we will cover before we conclude this topic of um, channel coding, 
we will take up this particular topic in in the next uh, video uh, that i'll be posting uh, but the answer uh, that we will be trying to get will be for a question that fine so we looked at all these different coding schemes um, Hemming codes and the product code and the RPC and LDPC and the turbo and the convolution code that you are doing. But what is the best possible channel coding scheme that, that can ever be developed, that can be ever designed? What is the, what is the best that we can do in terms of channel coding? Um, so remember that we had asked the same question when we did uh, data compression. And that time we asked that what is the best possible uh, compression that is possible of any data. And, and if you recall, that time our answer was that the entropy function of the uh, random variable corresponding to the information source determines the amount of data compression. Specifically for a binary source of information which generates m bits if that information source's entropy is hb of p then at the most you can compress those m bits down to m times hb of p you can't do anything better than that so similarly uh, let's ask what is the best possible channel coding that anybody can ever come up with there our question has to be a little more precise uh, we are not uh, repeating the same question uh, about data compression here anymore but instead what we want to do is first of all by channel coding schemes we always want to make our better rate go down as much as possible that, that is the whole entire purpose of channel coding the coding scheme should not only detect that the bits have been uh, corrupted but it should also recover those corrupted bits at the end we should have recovered all the corrupted bits and none of our bits should be in error so that is the best uh, way of uh, doing channel coding but there is a little spin to that there is one more thing that we have to consider which is that we do not want to make our probability of better go down and also the rate of the code go down because if the rate becomes very small then that is not good for us we are we are wasting our communication resources um, and so what we want to do is uh, given a particular probability of flipping of BSC or eraser for BEC or in case of Gaussian noise channel a particular SNR we want to answer the question of what the best channel coding scheme is which will minimize the probability of bit errors while maximizing R so we want to make the bit error rate go down maybe make it zero no 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 errors no bit errors after channel decoding so channel decoder should cover should recover all the errors that have happened out of all the channel coding schemes that can recover uh, from the errors for a particular p or for a particular snr the best channel coding scheme is the one which can do that with for the highest value of r Think about it. That, that, that is the way to answer uh, or uh, the way to form formulate the question about what is the best possible channel coding scheme. We want to make the probability of bit error go down to zero. But at the same time, for a given P, we want to maximize R. We don't want to give up too much on the rate R. If you make R very small, if R is almost like zero, very close to zero, then big deal. I mean, we, we have reduced the bitter rate down to zero, but we have made R also zero. So then that, that is not good. I mean, then 
then then that doesn't help us as much so that is the question that we will be trying to answer in the next video